Well, hello there. Uh, uh, before I start, a word of warning. Those of you who know me from previous editions for, of this conference would also know that I'm totally against applying recipes. And yet I'm going to spend the next 30 minutes sharing recipes with you. So treat them as an inspiration, not at, at recipes. As recipes. So, it was several years back and I was sitting at an Agile conference. And the weather was lovely, so I was sitting outside because I was skipping through yet another conference session about how to make Agile retrospectives better. And I'm obviously wondering what the hell I was doing at that event. Now, don't get me wrong, I knew that event from its early days. And back then, it was interesting, it was inspiring. The thing was that a few years passed and I moved on. I was more into complex and advanced stuff and the conference, the conference was still serving pretty much the same basic content as it had been from its early days. So there I was, an expert. As we all here are, agile and lean experts, aren't we? so full of ourselves, so full of our complex and advanced stuff that we don't want to talk about stand-ups and plannings and heavens forbid Agile retrospectives anymore. We could spend days talking about maturity models and flight levels and organizational cultures and yes, there is a lot of self-criticism going on here. But you know what? As much as it's fun for us, some of us, maybe many of us, it's also really hermetic. Because what teams need, what teams still struggle with, are those very basic patterns and practices of Agile. So it's no wonder that there are so many conferences still serving the same basic content and being successful, because those teams want, the, uh, want that and need that. So let me briefly introduce myself. My name is Pavel uh, and I lead Lunar Logic. And typically when I'm introducing myself at one of those conferences, I would go ahead and tell you how Lunar Logic has this exceptional organizational culture, how we have no managers, how anyone can make any decision, and yada, 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 yada. But today I want to take a different angle. So Lunar Logic is a web and mobile development agency, which means that we are working with clients all over the world, both early stage startups and established companies, embedding our engineers, our developers, designers, testers in all sorts of teams. Which means that we have a pretty good overview of how the actual teams out there work. Even those teams that do not have agile coaches around. But it's not only this. Also, when you end up working with us, you, got, you, you get the full package. So it's not only that we would provide you with development and design professional services, but also whenever we see how we can help you to improve the way your teams work, we would. And there is a lot of selfish motivation in that. Because ultimately, if we want to work on well-oiled, well effective teams, and the best way to do it, to achieve it, is to help your team to improve, well, this is what you get. So how do you think? Do we get to advise our clients on stuff like maturity models or flight levels or organizational culture? Nope. Not a single time. When we get to help our clients, it's about stuff like stand-ups and plannings and estimation and retrospectives. Because this is what those teams still struggle with. So how about we take a step down from our ivory tower, tower of self-righteousness and use our hard-earned experience to talk about the basics again? Because if you think about it, if we really get back to the basics, would we advise those teams to do stuff by the book, whatever the book is, whatever is the book that we're talking about? Would we really replicate the same practices and patterns that we did 10 and 15 and 20 years ago? Would we? 
or rather we would treat those patterns and, pra and practices as an inspiration rather than a recipe. Wouldn't we reinvent many of those practices and patterns? So let's spend the next 25 minutes or so talking about the very basic practices of Agile. As basic as it gets. And where is a better place to start than with daily meetings or stand-ups? By far the most popular Agile technique. And most of the time they would, they would follow this pattern of answering the three questions. What were you doing yesterday? What, what will you be doing today? Do you have any problems? Now, if those meetings were honest, like brutally honest, they would go probably like this. So what were you doing yesterday? Well, I was working on that feature. I haven't finished it yet. Well, seriously, that feature to which you are assigned on the board? Like, no kidding? And what will you be doing today? Well, since I haven't finished that feature, I will continue working on it. Duh! It's on the board. And do you have any problems? And here comes a 10 minute long rant about a technical detail no one really cares about. And no one's giving you back those 10 minutes of your life. So how about this? Let's ban the free questions. Let's forbid using them. Because those questions were invented like when? 25 years ago? Back then, it wasn't true that every team, every single team had a visual board. And now it does have a visual board. And if you want to know who's doing what, just go and see for yourself it's on the board. And if a daily meeting is focused on syncing up collaboration, ask questions that are focused on syncing up and collaboration. Does anyone need any help with, with something? Do you want to pair up on your task? Use that meeting as an opportunity to invite people to have that discussion about that technical detail that is pestering you, but outside of the daily meeting, only with those who are interested in that discussion. And if no one is, you get the signal that no one really cares about. And with that, you would get your daily meeting so much shorter and so much more effective. And also, Note that I understand that some teams are using daily meetings as, uh, for social purposes, and I have no beef with that. It's just when you are doing that, be mindful that this is the goal and this is why you want to have some chit-chat during, during your daily. And when you throw, uh, throw out those three, three questions, you may add a new one to your toolbox. So consider this one. Can we take that offline? This is the biggest time saver in my life during daily meetings. Whenever someone would go into details, and if you are consider considering if going too much into details is too much, it means that it is, or you notice someone phasing out, not listening, ask that question. Can we take that offline? Outside of a daily meeting, just for people who are interested in it. It may be just af uh, outside, just after the daily stand-up, but do not involve everyone forcefully to have that, uh, have that discussion. Again, it would shorten your stand-ups and it would, it, would more, uh, it would make them more energized and more effective. Now let me park daily, daily meetings for a while. We'll come back to, to, the, to them. And let's talk about what I consider the most underutilized pattern of visualization, which is using blockers. So my advice is, use blockers extensively. So what is a blocker in my book? A blocker is anything, anything that would prevent a team from progressing with a task or finishing it. Even if that's the most minor thing, like, I don't know, product owner trying to figure out how we want to finish that feature, a blocker. We are waiting for up-to-date documentation to the API which we are using, a blocker. Uh, testers came back with a handful of bugs to that feature, a blocker. Our clients taking their time to respond to our questions, a blocker. Everything, everything that prevents us from progressing further. Now, do this exercise. Go to, the, to a team of yours, any team of yours if you're you a coach or someone, and ask them to go through the board item by item and ask them, for each and every item, is there anything, anything 
that prevents them from finishing up that, that task. And if there is, put a blocker on it. By the end of this exercise, you might have blocked a better part of the board. And before you started, there were hardly any blockers on the board. Now why? Because teams tend to use blockers only for the most major and only external sources of blockages. And if you still don't believe me that using blockers is the most underutilized pattern of visualization, look no further than at electronic tools like Jira's and Trello's of this world. Is there a way to make blockers visible, like really visible, like pencil in the eye visible, like this visible? No. If you're lucky, you will get a checkbox somewhere there that you can check. And if you're like really, really lucky, there would be a red lining displayed around a, a work item. That's it. That's how far it gets. And it's not a difficult feature to build. If teams wanted that feature, it would be there for a long, long time. Now, the question is why blockers are so important. Because if blocker is anything that prevents you from finishing up a task, it means that if we are not attending to blockers, we are extending our lead times, we are increasing work in progress, which basically means we are making our teams less effective. That's it. And if we start using blockers, we can reinvent how we run our dailies. So instead of, uh, instead of asking those three less than useful questions, you may gather around the board and read it from the right to the left, from the right to the left. It's an intuitive when you are doing a mirror image. And why from the right to the left? Well, read the board from the closest to done to the furthest to done, because statistically speaking, if it's something is closer to done, it requires less work to finish. And in the spirit of stop starting, start finishing, we just want to start finishing stuff. So read the board from the right to the left, but read only, focus only on the items that are blocked, only on them. And for each of them, ask the team, what are we doing to unblock that item? That's it. Once you went through the blockers, you are done. Because everything else is business as usual. I mean, you want to focus on this? Go to the board, look at who's doing what. Again, with this trick, I've just made the team so much more effective during stand-ups and also focusing on the right things. And when you start doing this, you can also reuse that trick for every occasion when anyone in a team is uh, taking another task. And we have a fancy lingo for that. It's pool principle. We are pooling work. So we can change how we do pool principle, how we implement pool principle, because most of the time it would be like this. Who am I? I'm a backend developer. What do I do? I code backend. So what do I do when I finish my task? I go to the backlog, find the next backend task, and I pull it and start coding it. Now, it may make you more efficient, give you that, but it doesn't make your team more effective. And since you've just learned that trick of reading the board from the right to the left and focusing on, on blockers, you can reuse it right now. So instead of pulling the next task from the backlog, you can go to the board, read it from the closest to done to the furthest to done, and focus on blockers. And for each and every blocker, you may ask yourself a question, can I do anything, anything, to help unblock this item? Even if it's not necessarily in your sphere of comfort. Like, it may mean that you would write an email to the client, reminding them about the answers that we are waiting for. It may mean messaging with those developers of that API that we have problems with. It may mean that you are helping your front-end colleague with a hairy problem that they are facing. It may mean that you are fixing bugs in the code that you haven't written because, oh well, the developer who, uh, who wrote that code, code is on a sick leave. And only, only when you went through the whole board, through all the blockers, and you did not find anything useful to do, only then you go to the board again, read it from the right to the left, but look at the items that are not blocked. And look for the things that are abandoned, that no one is taking care of. Because every now and then, we would have that item that fell off the table. And there are stages of our development process that are notorious of having such tasks. 
like waiting for code review forever and ever, forever, forever and ever and ever. So go look for such tasks. And if there is anything, go do that, even if that's outside of your sphere of uh, comfort. It may mean that you are reviewing code in the part of the app that you are unfamiliar with or in the technology that is not your strongest suit. But that's fine. So, and only if you went through the board twice and you found literally nothing to do, only then you retreat back to your old strategy, go to the backlog, find another task and start working on it. Now with this trick, I have just improved collective code ownership, improved knowledge sharing, reduced lead times, and reduced work in progress. All without even introducing the idea of whip limits, thank you very much. Now for something completely different. Planning. Who does not love planning? I mean, those meetings that takes a few hours of our time every week or every other week where we are discussing all the details, all the ins and outs of all the features that we may end up potentially building during the next couple of weeks or so. It is fun, isn't it? Have you noticed that, that there's exactly one person one person who is interested in the entirety of a planning meeting, and that is a product owner or whoever is an equivalent. For everyone else, it's pretty much, well, I would tune in when we are talking about stuff that I may end up working on, and I would tune out for pretty much everything else. And also, by the time I start working on that work item that we discussed 10 days ago, things might have changed because, oh well, we have a week and a half of work, uh, of work done in that time. Also, the priorities might have changed. So we are bound to repeat that discussion anyway, at least to a point. So how about do as much ad hoc planning as possible? And when I say ad hoc planning, it's like, oh, I'm about, I'm about to start working on this thing. Who wants to join me for a brief discussion about that item? Maybe the work that you've done influences how I will do this. Maybe the way I will do this will influence your future work. Let's just have an ad hoc discussion. Now, I understand that it's not always feasible to have this, this kind of radical ad hoc discussion because, well, we are working with clients in different time zones. And right now, they may be sleeping. So we don't have an option to call them. But even then, we talk to them daily. So why can't we use that opportunity to do more ad hoc planning than this kind of long, long meeting every, every couple of weeks? And when we are on planning, don't ever, 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 I beg you, do not ever do estimation during planning meetings, ever. And it's not only story point estimation. It's like any estimation or si sizing effort. If planning meetings tend to be to a degree wasteful, this is the ultimate waste. And obviously, like, uh, there is this, uh, this ultimate villain, which is story point estimation, but it's not all only about story point estimation. It's about any sizing effort. So uh, we had this client several years back, and they were doing story point estimation. Um, and they weren't really receptive when we were telling them that, you know what, it doesn't provide that much value. But they insisted, they, they, keep, they want to keep doing that. So I did my homework. I looked at historical data, I did some number crunching, and I came back to them and I was like, hey, have you noticed that in the first quarter, your fives, like five story point big uh, features, your fives were smaller than your threes? But don't worry. In the second quarter, fives were already bigger than threes. They were also bigger than eights, but what have you. Uh, they were still like, well, this is our way, as if they were watching too much of Mandalorian on Disney+. Plus. But the thing was, pretty much everything that they were working on was just a feature. And they would be so much better off instead of wasting two hours of the time every other week of the whole team if they just, just measured throughput, which is how many features they were able to, to accomplish in any given iteration. 
Because ultimately, they were trying to answer the question how much stuff they, they can cram into that team during the next iteration, next month, next quarter. And they had an answer. It would be enough if they just looked at throughput and they would save two hours of, of work of the whole team every, every other week. It would also make them more effective, wouldn't it? And now when we are talking about throughput, I cannot not mention statistical forecasting. And I know it's not basic, but let me have, have this one. So for years, I was a huge fan of statistical forecasting. So whenever a client would, would ask me, hey, Pavel, when will it be done? I would look at historical data, I would pull lead times, I would run the Monte Carlo simulation, I would produce a distribution of potential futures, and I would give our client an answer. It's like, oh, so here are my confidence levels for this, the, this specific dates. And also, I would probably need to explain what this whole statistical forecasting thing, thing was anyway. Right now, I'm not doing that anymore. What I'm doing instead, I just look at throughput, week after week after week after week, and then I average it out, do a linear approximation, and treat that as if it was my 50% confidence interval. Like, I was 50% sure that we will be done by that date. And now you can tell me that, hey, Pavel, it's not the actual math. You're breaking the laws of the science because you cannot use averages unless you are sure that you have a normal distribution and most likely the distribution of your throughput over week is not normal. And you know what? I don't give a damn. I'm not trying to prove a math thesis here. I'm just trying to produce an accurate enough, a reasonable enough answer to a question when will it be done. And it just so happens that this answer is accurate enough, is reasonable enough, and it requires, me, uh, requires uh, of me less work. So this is why I'm using it, even if it's not the actual science. But then we also face those situations where uh, estimation is a bigger challenge. So when we are about to estimate a new batch of work, and we don't have historical data for that batch of work, for that team. So what do I do? I retreat back to, magic to the magic numbers. And when you hear a phrase magic numbers, you probably have this image in front of you, a developer spending hours and hours agonizing, trying to understand each feature that is in the scope, trying to guess how much time it will take to build, then summing it up, and then a manager would multiply it by a magic, the magic number of two just to be safe. So these are not magic numbers that I'm using. Uh, so I still based on the historical data. So I would gather historical data uh, throughputs, or better yet, uh, tax time from all sorts of teams. And uh, what's the difference between throughput and tax time? Throughput answers the question how many features we were able to deliver in a given time period. Tax time gives an answer to a question how frequently, on average, we are delivering a feature. So how much time it takes uh, for the team to deliver a feature on average. So I would look at tag times of different teams, and I would sort them out by the team lineup. So for example, a typical small team at Lunar would be two developers, part-time tester, part-time designer. So I would look at the, the, this kind of teams. And I would look what's the minimum tag time and what's the maximum tag time. And I would come up with an answer that it's like anything between, I don't know, 1.2 day working days to 1.8 working days. And then I would use those as my magic numbers, the optimistic magic number and the pessimistic magic number. Now, when I'm about to estimate a new scope for a new client, new product, whatever, the only thing that I'm missing is to figure out how many features will be there, roughly. I don't even need to understand what kind of features. I don't care. I just need to figure out whether it's a 30 feature big project or 60 feature big, big project or 120 feature big project or whatever. And then I multiply it by my positive, positive magic number, my, uh, my negative magic number, and I get a range. And that's it. And if my magic numbers are off, I still don't care because there is so much more uncertainty regarding what we will eventually end up building in terms of how the scope will be changing than whether my magic numbers were good or bad. Because scope will be changing. And the, the, the thing that the client, our client in this case is trying to answer is not how much exactly it will cost, because if they do, they would go and hire fixed price uh, kind of uh, 
company or a developer and we are not doing that. But they are trying to answer a question, whether I'm able to turn this idea of mine to an actual product for the bag of gold that I have. And it's pretty much yes or no answer. And with this method, they can reliably answer it. So now let's make Lean Agile London an actual Agile event. And let's talk about how to make Agile retrospectives better. Shall we? So, Agile retrospectives most frequently follow uh, the pattern of answering three questions. What went well? What went wrong? What do we want to change? Now, Agile does have this thing with, ans with three less than useful questions, doesn't it? So, what went well? Well, we would mention all sorts of things that we are good at, and we know that we are good at, and we want to keep them more of that, which is like, the. And most of the time, it doesn't add any value. Well, except of the occasions where you want, you know, this kind of pat in the back event. We are doing, we are doing great. But then it's not a retro; it's a celebration. Then what went what went wrong? Well, uh, there are things that were kind of one off, and we don't care about them. They went wrong, but we don't care about improving them. There are there are things that we want to improve, and they are in our sphere of control, and they will be doubled as an answer to the third question anyway. And there are all those like, big hairy changes that, well, we don't really control. And again, sometimes there is an occasion to you know, vent some frustration. And if you need that, totally do that. But then it's a venting event and not a retro. So if first two are not useful, maybe the third is. So what do we want to change? What do I want to change about my last project? Well, the company politics sucked. Yeah, and the client was less than empathetic, really. And the te tech stack, well, this thing was ancient. And, and I would so much like the product agenda to be more aspirational. And when we add it, maybe we should do something about global warming. So the thing is, answering that question often turns into this kind of wishful thinking contest. And we end up with, with this huge amount of things and we won't do much about them because you know what we cannot spend the next month only trying to improve the way we work because we have all those like business as usual things that we need to take care of and we have only that little time to focus on improvements so we are kind of dooming ourselves for failure looking at this overwhelming list of things to change so how about let's throw out those three questions and start asking just one what is one thing, a single thing, that we will be doing differently by the next retro, whenever it comes? If it's in two weeks, then in two weeks. Just focus on one thing. And not only any one thing, one thing that is achievable by the time the next retro happens. You will gather only a handful of ideas, like maybe two, maybe three, maybe four, and then just measure the temperature of the room. Which one of those is the most painful for the team and commit to fix only one by the next retro. And you can say that, well, this way you will be focusing only on those small changes. And yes, it is true, but you will also get a momentum. You will also figure, find out that you have so many of those low-hanging fruits that you are not running out of them anytime soon. And also, by the time you run out of, of those small changes, probably your big, hairy changes have been addressed as well. Just not the way you expected. And also, I have just made your retros so much shorter and so much more effective, didn't I? So if there is a theme in this presentation, it's probably, it's probably it. So, with this, I have just delivered a presentation about how to make Azure retrospectives better. I can, and I can rest happy. Thank you very much. <laughs>